thrilled uh, to be here just because what you all are doing in practice, focusing on details, is a spiritual truth of our country. You know, we can be Democrats and Republicans, but most Americans are patriots. For over a decade now, good ideas have emanated from the BPC. Thank you for convening this very impressive group of, of thought leaders. Your organization has brought together leaders from across our society to advocate for common sense solutions to our most challenging problems. Because if it's bipartisan, it's much more likely to pass. When you have people philosophically and ideologically in two different worlds, and they put them together on a committee, that committee usually is not very productive. Once we get staffs blending, and John and I, they know that the members are friends and we talk, things can happen. Thank you, Anand, for that introduction, and to the BPC for its important efforts. Thank the bipartisan policy uh, center. You, you guys are great. I have, uh, we all have bipartisan responsibilities to this nation to defend principles that have long made America the beacon of hope. It's going to take all of us to try to turn down the temperature and really focus on what unites us. Good afternoon, good evening, good morning, everybody, uh, whatever time zone you're in. My name is Mark Walsh. I'm the moderator of today's session here on the BPC website. Um, I am a board member of the Bipartisan Policy Center and have been for almost 13 years. So many of the endorsements you just saw are from folks that uh, I was proud to have served along with as either a board member or a colleague in efforts that the BPC put together. Um, I'm also a venture capitalist here in the Washington DC area. And perhaps as importantly, I worked for the Small Business Administration many moons ago under the last couple of years of the Obama administration in the exact same job that one of our esteemed panelists currently occupies, Billy DeVries. I will introduce a videotape, uh, a recording rather, I, should, I shouldn't date myself with that technology, uh, from Congressman Dean Phillips, a Democrat from Minnesota, talking about the uh, Small Business Administration. After we witness that, or after we watch that recording together, I'll come back with our panel, introduce them, and we'll get our conversation started. Hi, everybody. I'm Congressman Dean Phillips, and I have the wonderful honor of representing Minnesota's 3rd Congressional District in the United States Congress. I want to thank the Bipartisan Policy Center for inviting me to speak today at this important event about the SBIC program. Minnesota, my home state, is home to 24 SBIC funds, and since 2017, SBICs have invested about $660 million in 130 small businesses across the state. Each year, the SBIC program collectively invests billions in small businesses, helping spur economic growth, supporting job retention, and providing the most invaluable resource, access to capital. Most assuredly, an SBIC has provided financing to a company that you probably know and love. Now, I've started and managed both large and small businesses over my career, and those experiences have taught me the importance of securing financing from trusted partners to help launch, to run, and to grow a business enterprise. Yet far too many of our nation's small business owners, particularly in minority and underserved communities, have no choice but to rely on their own savings, their personal credit lines, help from their families and friends, loans off their mortgages, and more. Now the 10,000 Small Businesses Voices survey reports that 94% of respondents, that's right, 94%, said that it is essential for legislators to ensure access to flexible, affordable capital for small business owners. The proposed SBIC rule identifies important priorities, including lowering barriers for entrance to the program for new types of funds and diversifying investments to better serve the financing needs for all types of small businesses. For example, most SBICs presently engage in mezzanine lending. Now, while this is helpful for many types of small businesses, it is not a strategy that works for every type of business enterprise. We need to expand the diversity of small business lending, incentivized by public policy, in multiple ways and multiple facets. Now, that means different innovative investment strategies that recognize the needs of new businesses versus existing businesses and firms across various industries. That means increasing the geographic diversity of investments and recognizing that sectors such as venture capital have 80% of their activity concentrated on the two coasts, east and west. That means investing in black, brown, and Asian entrepreneurs and small business owners in underserved communities all around the country. And most importantly, the proposed rule also recognizes the need to invest in diverse fund managers. I applaud the agency's efforts to bring more managers from diverse backgrounds into the SBIC program. Now, simply put, 
we need to meet the needs of small business owners where they are. And I'll be tracking this SBIC rule closely, and I urge all of you to share your thoughts with me. I need your perspective. I also want to recognize that various legislative proposals have tried to shape the direction of the SBIC program over time. These proposals have sought to expand the capacities of the program to service the financing needs of small businesses. And it is critical, uber critical, that our policy initiatives continue to evolve and reflect the best practices of the private sector. I'd like to share my thoughts about one area that really shows enormous potential to keep businesses and jobs in local communities and build wealth for workers in minority and underserved communities all around the country. And that is employee ownership, sharing ownership, spreading the wealth, and rewarding those that make success possible. It presents a solution to the silver tsunami. Many small business owners at or near retirement will close their doors or sell their firms to large corporations or other buyers in the M&A markets. Outcomes that ultimately can hurt employees, their communities, and our overall economic health. And that's where the potential for employee ownership exists. Congress can put forth policies that incentivize employee ownership and make it a viable option for both sellers and employee owners, thus giving employees a stake in the business, keeping firms in local communities, both urban, suburban, and rural, and preserving competition throughout our economy. Best of all, employee ownership draws broad bipartisan support. Yes, Democrats and Republicans agree. Employee-owned firms are more resilient, more sustainable, and more productive than traditional businesses. Employee ownership aligns the interests of workers and owners. It is a clear and unusual win-win. Now, there are some challenges. It's complicated. Business owners aren't often aware of employee ownership models, and employees don't have the capital often to finance the transactions themselves. That's why I'm working on legislation that aims to close the gap in awareness of and capital for employee ownership conversions. My legislation aims to support private investment funds that finance employee ownership by leveraging public and private financing to create a more robust capital market to establish and grow employee-owned businesses. In fact, this week, I'll be chairing a hearing on employee ownership where we'll hear directly from such a firm. Now, I'm a firm believer that representation begins with listening. So please, I invite you, I encourage you, and I implore that you share your ideas with me and together we can work to build a more equitable and resilient small business ecosystem throughout the United States of America. Thank you so much for your invitation today. Keep the faith, keep in touch, and let's get this done. Thanks, everybody. We're back, and once again, that was Congressman Dean Phillips, Democrat from Minnesota, who just invited, encouraged, and implored us, three very strong uh, exhortation, so to speak, to make sure that he and his office and I guess his colleagues on the committee know exactly what some of all of us or really hopefully people that are watching today and everyone involved in the SBA's SBIC and SBIR community to pass along their thoughts of what makes the program even better. Um, our panel today is exciting. We have representation from various elements of the of the overall program. Let me start first. Uh, and by the way, this is why LinkedIn was invite, invented. So I highly encourage you to, uh, if you're interested in learning more about my three colleagues on today's session, to go to LinkedIn or some other social media and learn more about them. But we'll start with Chris Rossi. Chris is in uh, uh, Philadelphia. He is a partner with uh, Troutman Pepper. Former Pepper Hamilton is when I interacted with Chris back in the day at the SBA. Uh, secondly, we're joined by Pam Hendrickson. Pam is the uh, chief operating officer and vice chairman of the Riverside Company. Um, and lastly, perhaps most importantly, we're joined by Bailey DeVries. Bailey is the new associate administrator at the Small Business Administration, specifically overseeing the Office of Investment and Innovation, as we used to call it, OI, uh, which, is, which administers the SBIC program, the SBIR and STTR program, and all of the efforts in incubators and accelerators. And those of you who know the federal government, you have to have a bunch of acronyms uh, thrown at you at some point. So I have duly, uh, I, I have fulfilled my legal duty by tossing acronyms at you, and hopefully we can keep them uh, limited during our session today. So with that, let me turn to our panel. Uh, once again, if I could, just, just comment on one thing. If you're watching and you have a specific question, either for me, hopefully not for me, but for our panelists concerning what we're going to discuss, please feel free to put it in chat. We have some folks monitoring it here at the Bipartisan Policy Center in Washington, D.C., and some of your questions may well make it up to the top, and I will ask our panelists about them. If you uh, please 
specify to which panelist your question is directed, if so. So I'll start with the obvious one and go with you, Bailey. Um, it, at least when I had your job, I spent a lot of time explaining what it was, the four letter acronym that sadly far too people knew about. Give our listeners, our viewers, and everybody involved the, the short uh, bullet point description of the program that you've been asked to manage. Great, um, and great point, Mark. Um, so the SBIC program, what in the world is it? So an SBIC, it's essentially a license that we give to a private fund that focuses its investment on small businesses in the US, startups and small businesses. What, what do we do? Uh, we essentially crowd in more private investment in these funds. So that way they can partner with small businesses to help them grow, sustain, and scale. Um, and today the program represents about $38 billion of SBA guaranteed capital and private capital in total. And the whole mission is for us to stimulate and supplement the flow of capital to small businesses, to places where we know it's just not adequately flowing. So we play a really important role in the US economy. I'm gonna stick with you for a second because before I go to Pam and Chris, uh, a license, yeah. how does one apply for a license and does that license then represent actual funds into the professional manager? So how does one apply? Well, um, for any fund managers in the office, uh, or sorry, that are in the audience right now, the way I would think about it is it's a lot like going through a due diligence process uh, with a potential investor in your fund and an institutional one. We are going to look at the investment strategy. We're going to look at the operational elements of the fund. And we're also going to look for mission alignment with the mission of the program um, as described uh, in the statutory law that was set in place by Congress. And in terms of the money part, so does a license mean money? It can, but not necessarily. We have licenses that we provide um, and uh, that we provide without capital. And then we have those that we provide with capital. The one with capital, we call a leverage license. You might say, why would somebody apply for a license if the government's not giving them money? Well, the reason that some folks apply for the license um, and not for the capital is that uh, SBICs are eligible for Community Reinvestment Act credit. And so that makes them very interesting to potential bank investors. So let's move. Thank you for that. That's that's well done. And obviously, uh, when you when you got that job, I think you probably had to learn the elevator pitch, so to speak, for a program that can often be complex and is certainly complex to some folks that have applied for it. But at the end is a very simple program, both in the definition of those who receive capital and those who don't receive capital. Uh, so thank you for that. Now, um, uh, Pam, you actually run an SBIC. Uh, so let's get to the operational side of this description. What Walk us through the process that you and your colleagues, why you decided to apply for one, how long it took, what you got back, and what it means to be part of the SBIC family as far as reporting and information and relationship to the overall agency. Well, actually, we've run three. Sorry, um, three. Yeah, Sorry. Three. The, the first two are actually um, more like what um, the new rule looks like because in the first two, we were a control buyout. We were in our control buyout strategy. We've always focused on small businesses and we always admired the SBIC program. So it seemed sort of like a natural fit. Um, it took us a while, honestly, to figure out how to apply for it, but we did. And we were so happy that then we went to an, another one and then more recently we are um, running our third which is sort of more traditional it's a debt fund like many but our first two we um, actually use the SBA debentures to uh, lend to companies at market rates and build an interest reserve on the difference in the spread between what the SBA charged us and when we were comfortable that the reserve was big enough we use the debentures as equity. Um, and that was a really great program. There, you know, there's um, there's paperwork you have to do as with anything. I think Bailey's uh, description of it as a DDQ, think of it as a DDQ. 
is uh, exactly right. Um, you know, and you just need to assign someone to do it and then you can do it. DDQ being a due diligence questionnaire. Due diligence question. I'm sorry, I went to an acronym, which I realize I shouldn't have done, but it is led due diligence questionnaire. And I, I think, um, you know, our experience has been that once you understand what you're doing, um, it's actually pretty easy to do it. Well, let I me won't touch on easy, but <laughs> well, I, exactly. It's all it's all relative. But let me let me focus on that as I move over to Chris. But if I may, I just want to touch on DDQ. My time in the government, I realized that uh, I think the law of the government was that every single day I had to learn a new TLA, which stands for three letter acronym. So we've officially covered that for our panel today. So thank you for that, Pam. So complexity, but it's worth it. That's a theme that certainly was part of my experience. And I think Bailey, maybe you're seeing the same. Complexity is not necessarily a bad thing because these are taxpayer dollars that we're talking about that are going out the door or in the case of a non-capital uh, engaged license, it matters for Community Reinvestment Act, which is taxpayer dollars being saved. So Chris, walk us through your relationship to the program. What do you do in the program? What, what are you seeing from historical perspective and what you're seeing from uh, the Congressman's comments today? You're, mu you're muted. That's a that's a rookie move, Chris. Rookie move. Come on. Just a lot. Sorry. Uh, so um, I'm an attorney. I'm a partner at Troutman Pepper. Um, my practice concentrates on private private fund formation with a specialty in this SBIC creature. We have uh, one of the national practices in the country. Um, we have clients ranging from the coasts, New York, California, Massachusetts to um, Iowa uh, and West Virginia. Our clients run the gamut of um, investment styles. So, you know, the diversity of the type of investment that's being made ranges from um, venture capital funds. Um, we have clients in New Mexico, for example, or in Arizona that do that. We have clients uh, in West Virginia that do that uh, to, you know, your traditional mezzanine funds, to growth equity, to buyout funds. So the SBIC program does provide flexible capital and enables a lot of fund managers um, uh, from all stripes to be able to participate in the program. My primary function is counseling companies through the licensing process, the DDQ, uh, and in negotiating their arrangements with their limited partners, structuring their affairs. Um, and you know, in a lot of ways, I serve as an ambassador to the program because I field a lot of calls about it. And most, I'm getting more and more about them because of the excitement that's brewing relative to, you know, these regulations and the expansion of the program. So we'll, we'll touch on that term ambassador to the program. I think that's an interesting label that Chris, you and your colleagues at your firm and other, a few other firms that really focus on this. And sure, I'm sure Pam, you've probably engaged some of those very same firms and I'm sure Bailey, you see them in the due diligence process when, um, when applicants for the license show up with, with, with advisors. But I just want to level set for our uh, attendees today, the SBIC program, um, perhaps Bailey, you quote this as well. But in 1977, an SBIC owned 4% of a small technology company in Cupertino, California called Apple. An SBIC owned 4% of Apple in 1977. Now, before you get your hopes up, uh, back then it, it did not own any equity. It was still, as is today's structure, virtually all debt. There was no equity involved. But 4% of Apple um, in 1977 would be worth a lot of money today, perhaps would, would, would uh, fuel the entire program for, 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 for several years. There are hundreds, if not thousands of stories exactly like that, that I'm sure Bailey and her colleagues and Chris and Pam have seen, where an SBIC, uh, a chunk of SBIC capital has done good work that makes a difference to not only a company and to its employees, but to an industry, to a region, to uh, gender diversity, de demographic diversity, and in fact, to our entire nation. So forgive me for getting on my cheerleading soapbox, but I find myself being an ambassador as well. So Chris, let me, let me move from your comment back to you, Bailey, because we just got a question from one of our attendees named Shuba Chakravarthy. I hope I said that right, Shuba. Um, it, it basically, it summarizes a lot of what my experience was, Bailey. And, and Shuba is an entrepreneur and basically asks, how can they learn more about the program quickly without a lot of the complexity and see if it's if it's worth it for them to try and get engaged. Now, as an entrepreneur, they're obviously at a company, so they may be looking for an SBIC licensee to get engaged with. 
which really isn't your job. But how would you answer that that kind of question? Gosh, um, I'll get to that. I also share with you. I love that you brought up the Apple example because um, you know this past weekend there was a really exciting announcement at the Reagan National Defense Forum. Administrator Guzman and uh, Secretary Austin um, uh, signed and shared remarks about um, a, a declaration of intent for our agencies um, to form a partnership um, to uh, work through the SBIC program. Um, for more capital to go to critical emerging technologies, um, just so vital for our national security and the overall well-being and peace on the planet. Um, and as part of the preparation, you know, we were talking about Apple and uh, we were also talking about Intel. We were talking about Sun Microsystems. We were talking about Tesla, all these amazing investments, all these amazing companies made possible uh, through the investment of uh, investment partners at SBICs and Apple, it was 63 employees at the time of that investment. It was debt initially and a little bit of equity later, and it came from a fund in Chicago. Did you know that? So just a thought. Um, so how can you learn more? Um, can I humbly say, I think we can do more. We can do a better job of, of educating and uh, meeting both the entrepreneurs and the fund managers where they are in terms of what is this? How do you access it? But if you're an entrepreneur, um, you know, one of the things that we do do is we um, publish a list of all of our SBIC partners on the sba.gov website with contacts and these amazing ambassadors and stewards of the program and our public private partners, um, you know, they're amazing and that they are all great about fielding calls. Um, I do think that there's more we can do to make sure it's clear what the investment strategy is of some of those funds and putting that in the terms that often the entrepreneur can understand. You know, is this a fund that's focused on seeding new businesses? Is this a fund that's focused on change of control transactions? Is it focused on, uh, you know, growth capital? Is it focused on debt? Um, so opportunities there, but I would certainly encourage looking at our website and um, there is a great industry association out there. There's more wonderful industry associations as well that are doing more uh, to look at the program, but I would say that the Small Business Investor Alliance does put out some great materials on their website about the program as well. The SBIA, for those of you who um, want to follow up on that, was an important, at least in my experience, and I think Bailey is echoing this, is a very important player. Effectively, they're the trade association for, for the whole program, and they, they, um, they are a tremendous resource for information. Let me just talk about the types of investments. Pam, I'm going to start with you and then ask Chris to come in as well for this one. Um, obviously, Bailey just touched on some of the incredible success stories and the alignment with DOD and how that, that productivity will, will pursue with Administrator Guzman, who was Deputy Chief of Staff when I was there, and, and I'm a huge fan. But this idea of what type of company the investors that have gotten a license pursue. Um, sometimes you see SBICs are buying into janitorial supply companies in rural Georgia, which is fine. They have jobs, they make products, it's all good. So the sizzle and sex appeal of some of the great names that got SBICs versus the meat and potatoes element of American small business sometimes get, gets lost in the description. What has been your experience in your three SBICs in both your, how you pursue individual companies or industries or regions and how much focus you were asked by the SBA and the and the and Bailey's team to what, what was the focus that they asked you to do versus what you ended up doing? Well, I don't I don't think um, you know there are, there are rules in terms of the size of business you can invest in. Um, our our control buyout SBICs invested in 25 companies. We started that program in 2010, so it's been around a long so not. A long time, so not as sophisticated as Apple, but one of the companies in there was Tate's Cookies. So a lot of people probably on this phone call or on this video know Tate's Cookies. Um, it's a it's a great story about someone who started baking cookies when she was 12 years old because she had a bad clothes habit, and her father said, "You got to make your own money." And um, with help from the SBA and from us and a bunch of other people, um, sold that cookie company to a public company, Mondelay, for $500 million. So, um, you know, that that is not the same as Apple, but it's a great story. Um, job growth, I think, for if I look at that cadre of companies, 
Um, jobs increased by 76% across the portfolio, across the 25 companies. And um, three of them were in rural areas using the Department of Agriculture, less than 50,000 population. Um, I think we're very returns focused at Riverside, so we will invest in company. I'm looking at the portfolio, and it's really been everything from Tate's Cookies to um, a company that uh, does membership for not-for-profits. So it's it's all kinds of different things where we see growth potential. Well, I consumed a Tate's Cookie last night, so I I thank the program for uh, for. for progressively showing the Tate's company to grow and then Mondelez is a huge owner, obviously. Well, Chris, let me go to you. Um, are you seeing a different flavor of behavior on licensed applicants in how they're describing themselves as far as their targeting, what types of companies, size of companies, expected uh, deployment of capital, expected return versus, you know, the, frankly, the rigor, the rubric that the Office of Investment and Innovation lays out for those applicants. H has it changed? Do you think it will change with some of the new legislation? I think that it has changed. So, you know, the SBIC program went through its bumps and bruises in the, you know, late 90s and the early 2000s through a program that doesn't exist anymore, which a lot of people have heard of, the Venture Capital, the old Participating Securities Program. And in 2008, the Obama administration, it really got reinvigorated under it. Um, uh, you know, we had a financial crisis and um, there, there was a need to, to, to match these uh, private dollars to invest in small businesses. And so the program really started to take off again after 2008. What I'm seeing is um, SBICs might look through uh, different lenses at their portfolio companies. And this is, you know, in more recent times as SBA has been focused on, you know, where are you investing? You know, are you, are you investing in already the overbanked? And are you just a competitor who has low priced cost of capital that's, you know, undermining um, others in, you know, transactions? Or are you really investing in small businesses? And, you know, I think that, you know, a lot of our, a lot of our clients and a lot of these SBICs do invest in small businesses. They look, you know, as we're going through the licensing process, we always run our clients through what we call the mirror test. Um, and that is, you know, does the, does the management team, its investment strategy, does it match the program? Um, you know, is the regulatory framework that you're going to have to operate within something you can operate within? And a lot of our clients will, you know, are surprised because most investors don't think of themselves, oh, I invest in LMIs or I invest in, I'm sorry, that was an acronym, low moderate three, income. Three letter, sorry. And things like that, right? So, um, I get them to look through that lens. You know, there's lots of maps that the federal agencies use um, to help define where areas are. And they find, my goodness, we actually really do invest in rural areas or areas of, of undermet need. And they're surprised yet, you know, very happy to see that um, because, you know, it makes, it, it, it makes them understand what they're really doing. And that's the nature of small business investing, right? It, it takes you to these places. Um, that are otherwise not, uh, that are not otherwise, you know, served. But there are small businesses that are, you know, big smaller businesses, meaning they employ 50 people, 100 people, 25 people, 250 people, real jobs supporting lots of families and communities. Um, I see a lot more um, emphasis on realizing what they're doing. So this, this move, which, I think most citizens would probably applaud uh, that the congressman mentioned, and, and Bailey, I'll get to you for some more detail on this, but we have a question specifically about one of the things that was mentioned. It comes from uh, an attendee named Jason Lamb um, talking about uh, employee ownership. So how far down does the equity ownership of the entity that got an SBIC investment go? How far down into the, the, the populace of employees does it go and how can we track whether that ownership turns out to create citizen wealth? Because at the end of the day, we, we'd love to have the program generate wealth at places and through people and, and uh, through demographics and genders that typically don't have access to the kind of wealth creation um, that, that, we all, that we all care about. So what are some ways, uh, Billy, I'll start with you and then get to uh, Pam and Chris. What are some ways 
that you're attempting to track this or have tracked it or in the future looking to, to track it? I love these questions. Um, and you know, it's, uh, and Mark, when you were in my shoes, you probably thought about this too, which is what is the role that we play? Um, how can we affect change from our seat? Um, what things um, make sense for the federal government to get directly involved in versus things where we can send demand signals or we can facilitate the flow of information or relationships. Um, the program is about public-private partnership, right? Um, so we're not, we're not seeking to manage these funds. We shouldn't be managing these funds. That's why we wanna work with amazing partners that have a great depth of industry experience and have relationships. Um, relationships are so critical when it comes to making private investments and building trust is critical. So, you know, I, I just go back to it to think about our role. So with that in mind, first, when it comes to the idea of um, uh, employee ownership, uh, ESOP transactions, uh, I, think, I think there's so much exciting potential there. Um, I would offer up the perspective that um, private markets are very dynamic, right? And when we think about building regulations, when we think about um, uh, policy, when we think about um, anything that Congress passes in statute, I think it's always important to think about flexible frameworks that can endure and be robust over time because we have a lot of really brilliant creative people that work within the private markets. And so uh, I think it's important for us not to set, um, you know, uh, not to earmark, if that makes sense, uh, for specific types of transactions, but more to have a very flexible framework in place that supports a diversity of transactions um, that can occur and that can continue to evolve over time because there's lots of exciting things happening right now. There's lots of exciting things happening with income sharing agreements, with revenue-based investing models, um, you know, that can flex with top line revenue over time. You know, there's so many exciting things that are happening as new alternatives and ideas. Um, and we want to be supportive of uh, many different types of transactions so that we can meet small businesses where they are with their different needs. Now, when it comes to the data around um, you know, individual level employee ownership in the portfolio companies, one of the things that I just really will applaud the SBA for doing for many, many years is that you know, they've always been about the small business. So they've always wanted to know the information about the portfolio companies. They've always wanted to know, um, you know, who, who owns these companies. Um, and so for years, they've collected a, a lot of data from the SBICs about um, the gender and um, the race and ethnicity uh, of the, um, the owners of the portfolio companies, as well as um, geographic diversity about these businesses and industry information. Um, interesting, I'd say one of the things that uh, was an aha moment for me coming in 18 months ago was that we actually haven't tracked that information at the allocator level, at the GP level. Um, and, you know, we would, you know, we would su suggest that it might be helpful to also understand that information because of those points about relationships and networks um, and uh, looking at some of that information, we believe um, might be a good leading indicator of uh, the flow of funds to um, a broader and more diversified group of small business owners. Um, that, that I'd say is where we are today. I do think that there's probably uh, interesting opportunities over time as uh, we seek to take more of the Biden administration approach around you know, one collaborative federal government to partner with um, uh, you know, colleagues over at the, you know, the Census Bureau and at IRS to look at all of our data sets. Um, you know, I don't want to put too much burden on the SBICs. I think more burden you put financially and time-wise on our partners, um, the less attractive it can make the program. And uh, that puts up more barriers to participation. So we need to think about that. Well said. Um, in fact, if I may highly endorse your comments, Bailey, and I, I'll ask Chris and Pam to react. Uh, this idea of the collision and the dynamic tension between flexibility and regulation and rigor um, always seems to be one of the conversations, at least in my glorious time there, and, and it sounds like it's, it's thematic, the collision between what a responsible government agency needs to do to make sure taxpayer dollars aren't going places they shouldn't go and the flexibility, particularly in growth industries and high growth marketplaces and venture capital and 
private equity that's very adventuresome. That collision and dynamic tension is probably never going to go away. Uh, so I think you, you, your description to me was very, uh, very, very evocative. But I'll ask. I'll start with you, Pam. Um, obviously, data is king, and gathering data together about what what happens to companies, to people, the stock, the ownership, the value. Um, it's got to be something that you gather on your own. But how do you how do you and your colleagues think about or track the way they, that your investments have had an impact? that you then show to the federal government to prove that their investment in you was worthwhile. If it's just return, that's fine. But what are some other ways that you either currently or you think you may in the future be asked to sort of, uh, to, to, to sort of chronicle that? Well, we do track job growth. So we, are, we know, we can tell you um, ad nauseum, and we do track locations. So we, so we know all of that. But um, to Bailey's point about flexibility, I think we're, we're having a lot of conversations about how to spread ownership with all our portfolio companies. And I think where we are is it's not one size fits all. In certain instances, it makes sense. In certain instances, maybe a cash bonus is a better solution. In certain instances, if you have a call center, maybe it's better to use a, a a different kind of a worker solution kind of uh, approach. So um, Bailey and I have had several conversations about this, and and I think that we will um, going go forward with a more robust program on ownership. But we're just trying to figure it out because it is really complicated. Um, and to the point about resources, I do think um, you know repeat SBICs. Could, and I know this is something you're very focused on, Bailey. Um, it, it would be great to license quicker just to free up more resources so that more people can access the program. Gee, I, I never heard that during my, during I'm my sure time. I'm sure you didn't. <laughs> yeah. I mean, there's I, – look, I, I, I make light, and I don't, mean, I don't mean to diminish it, but there are clearly themes that are natural themes about, about complexity, paperwork, timing, and everything um, – which are probably like a Gordian knot unsolvable. But if I could, and Chris, I'm gonna start with you, although I'm now changing the question. We have two questions from uh, Victor Huang and, and Evan Absher around first time funds. And I know, uh, Bailey, you're probably facing this in a, in a wide variety of ways, especially with some of the new energy from the Biden administration that we heard from, from the Congressman about, about expanding access. First time funds were sort of an anathema, at least in my time there, because of risk. Chris, are you seeing more first-time fund applicants? Are you encouraging first-time fund applicants? Is the process of advising them through the entire uh, window and timing and, and, and fund, uh, fund gathering, is that much different than a second or third timer? So I do advise a lot of first-time SBICs, but not first-time funds, right? So there's a difference. Um, and I think it is hard for um, those who have never had a fund in a traditional uh, sense before to get through the process. It's a lot harder for an equity oriented group of people to get through the process because of the nature of the leverage and the and the and the capital. Some will go the unlevered route uh, for a host of reasons, among others, like the bank CRA credit. Uh, they attract bank investors. Banks, you know, at one time were very heavy investors in venture capital funds. Uh, there's no CRA credit for venture capital per se, but there is an exclusion from the Volcker rule now for venture capital funds. But that requires the fund to behave in a certain way as opposed to just having this license that says, I am an SBIC. It's a lot easier for them to monitor. Um, I think that's part of the theme that you're seeing in these new regulations is a way to, is a way to maybe be more open-minded about um, you know, first-time managers, I think you have to broaden the types of strategies that are going to come into play. Um, you know, first time people love to invest in equity, whether that's a buyout strategy or a venture or a growth equity strategy. It touches upon Pam's point. Let's not run the current funds that are doing well through, you know, the same process you're running early, you know, first time funds. And let's focus on them so that SBA can make good rate, you know, risk adjusted decisions. I mean, I always tell clients, no offense to SBA, but no one at the agency is paid to take risk. They're paid to not, you know, end up losing taxpayer dollars. And so they don't get an attaboy for when the debenture is repaid. Um, they get, you know, a another set of acronyms for when it's not. 
Uh, so, you know, I think that they that that's that's the drive to try to bring more, um, as Bailey uses the term pipes, right, into the small businesses because of these different needs. I think equity oriented funds are also more likely to expand ownership within their companies. Debt oriented funds, they have no say or control over that. Venture has a different model than buyout. I think there is a valuable place for buyout funds in the SBIC program. Um, it works sort of uh, for buyout funds. We have lots of clients that do them, but they provide all the capital. And so they have to have debt underwriting experience. Um, I think there are some challenges, you know, with respect to that kind of, uh, of a fund, but, you know, those are things that, you know, the conversations are about, but they're the ones who control kind of how the equity is, is, is disseminated. As Pam said, sometimes you, know, you can't give equity to an employee because they're an employee of an LLC. Well, you can't be an employee of an LLC if you have a profits interest. There's lots of complications, uh, but I do see those are the clients that are more likely to expand the scope because when you have aligned management and aligned employees, um, everybody's moving in the same direction. Pam, before we change topics into the congressman's comments, and I'll put Bailey on the on the griddle in just a minute on that. Any reaction or, or additional thoughts on what Chris talk, touched on? So I was just going to say, when it's funny that you said what you said, Chris, because in 2010, when we came up with this great idea that we were going to have kind of a different SBIC because we were going to use the debentures in a way that they hadn't been used before, everybody was like, "You want to do what?" But, but. We, we were able to get through the process and everybody was very flexible and it is actually was ended up being the best performing fund ever in its class. I mean, it's like the number one performing fund. So um, that speaks well for the equity program that you're pushing or, you know, that you want to get approved because then hopefully the SBA will do very well and I think companies will do very well. So. Well, that's actually a nice segue, and, and thank you, Pam, for that. Uh, to to return to our associate administrator of the Office of Investment and Innovation, Bailey, uh, we all heard the congressman's, was it imploring, encouraging, begging, whatever the heck he said, uh, to give feedback on some of the new features or the refreshment features that um, that the committee and the Hill are considering. Again, not this is not a gotcha question, but from where you sit, running the program, what are some of the things the congressman touched on or that you're hearing from the Hill and the committee that are of most interest to you, potentially most challenging, you think, for your role and your colleagues, or perhaps aspirational? Mm. Well, um, you know, he's a man after my own heart, imploring people to give feedback, because I think a lot of times people are afraid to give feedback. And, um, you know, at the end of the day, like, we have a we have a perspective from our team. We have a lot of folks who are just incredible and brilliant and bright, but they're, you know, they're here, they're in our office. They're, they're not necessarily seeing everything that private industry is seeing. And we need to do this together. The, the program is underpinned by the idea of public private partnerships. So people speaking up and getting a diversity of opinions about what this amazing program and these authorities that were given to us by Congress back in 1958 can do um, and what, what they need to do today. You know, we're in a, a place right now where we're seeing capital markets freeze up in many areas. And I think there's a great call to action there. Um, so our proposed rulemaking package, uh, you know, I, I am really keen and interested in hearing many different opinions and it is open for public comment until uh, December uh, 19th. Um, so please go to the Federal Register. Comment, comment, comment. Um, we do have to respond to everything that we get a comment on. So there you go. Um, the uh, that, so that, that's one thought there. Um, in terms of you know his comments around employee ownership, you know, we need to figure out how to get more ownership in the hands of employees. But back to you know Pam's point, um, you know this takes many many forms, um, and uh, you know I, I do think that we need to take a flexible approach. So I go back to the idea of what can we control, what can we do, and um, it's not an acronym. It might be an industry term, though. But I, I do believe that we need better product market fit with our uh, financial instrument. Um, you know, we've had a, I could say, maybe we've had a bit of a blunt object 
right? Um, in our in our debenture uh, that we offer, which is amazing. And you know, you're hearing all these great stories this past year that debenture led to the financing of over what, over seven point nine billion dollars in financial tra transactions to small businesses. So it's it's great. But as it says in the statute, the program was designed to enable the flow of uh, patient capital in the form of equity and long-term loans to small businesses. So uh, we're meeting part of our mission, um, but we are seeking to grow the pie and expand to make sure that we can cover all of those bases. And uh, to do that, you know, we believe that it is essential to have a second financial product on the shelf that can meet the needs of other types of investment strategies uh, to support the flow of, of equity. Um, but also to do lots of other great things. And I go back to this, um, you know, this discussion we've been having around first-time fund managers. And I'd ask anyone in the audience, you know, if, if you are limited on time and you're limited on money and you're going to go launch a fund, you're launching your small business. Are you going to go to friends and family and people, you know, from business first to get you going? Or are you going to go to the federal government to put yourself through a, you know, a, a nine to 18 month process, you know, when time is limited. Um, I'd love to see more first-time funds come directly to us in the right strategies that meet the eligibility requirements that we put out in, in the, the rule. But I'd also love to see a lot of amazing, great partners stand up um, as fund of funds that we could license that uh, can provide that flexibility, that can take um, additional risk and manage it through diversification. So we can start to nurture and cultivate uh, a, a large community of future SBICs. And, and maybe they will go on to be SBICs, but we're getting money to more capital allocators that have more relationships across the country. And then we can support a broad multiplier effect of the movement of funds to more small businesses. So we really want that, that flexibility there. So what will, I love your term blunt object, you know, it's the old, when you're a hammer, a lot of things look like a nail, right? So what, what is the second product on the shelf? How would you characterize it? Or what are the features of it that you would highlight? Yeah, so um, it is not the participating securities instrument. I just want to, you know, cut right to the chase there. Uh, a lot of times people say, oh, wait, you're putting the equity program back in place. That was that was a financial instrument. We are not offering that financial instrument again. We learned a lot of great things from that. Um, and we have a lot of amazing data now. Um, and we are offering a second type of debenture that we're calling the accrual debenture, where the interest accrues over the life of the debenture. There's no requirement for uh, the licensed fund to pay the interest on SBA uh, capital twice a year, right? So that works really well when you've got, you know, uh, debt investments, you, you can clip coupons and pay for that. But if you have venture, if you are a fund of funds, if you are growth equity, gosh, if you are doing any sort of uh, revenue-based lending or income sharing, and there's going to be a long time horizon potentially, it, it doesn't work, right? So we're we're leaving a large, large portion of the private markets unaddressed with our current debenture. And so our second debenture um, uh, is able to have uh, better cash flow uh, matching with those types of funds. And we're really excited about it. So uh, we have about 10 minutes or so left and we've had a hundred signups. So people are obviously very interested in this. I think we're close to a hundred people jumping on, on and off. Uh, before we get to sort of a final round of, of comments, let me ask Chris and then Pam specifically for their reaction to this new product market fit that Bailey has described uh, the office of uh, OII is, is pursuing. Chris, you first. Sure. I like it directionally as a general matter. I mean, we're studying the details and trying to think of unintended consequences. You know, we as a firm, when we're we mentioned that we're ambassadors. We represent LPs, GPs. Um, we were kind of involved in the whole ecosystem. So we try to think of everything from everybody's perspective and also how it can affect the current program, right? Um, but I like the thinking and the creativity behind the use of a debt instrument. We're kind of stuck with what you know we have. I'm looking back at the old early stage manager, um, Mark, you know, that was promulgated 
uh, you know, before you and then when you came in and, you know, made some improvements to that, whether there's some learnings from that. I know there were only five of those. I think there were different reasons why there were only five of those than who had nothing to do with their lack of success. Heck, one is SBIC of the year. Uh, so, you know, I think that, you know, we're thinking it through as an industry and we're, you know, helping SBIA with their comment letter, but I know there's a lot of interest in it. I sent this uh, proposed rulemaking in our summary to a lot of those first time clients that I've been talking to that are interested in the program, trying to get a sense of what they're thinking about it. Um, there's a lot of positives, but there's also some, you know, not quite sure how this fits. So well, from Pam's perspective, what she's thinking, I've been at those open meetings and I know what some, some people are, but I like the idea. So Bailey threw down the gauntlet, imploring feedback. Pam, uh, you have real time opportunity here. Why don't you go ahead? Well, I, I too applaud the creativity. Um, and, you know, I, I think one of the challenges is going to be about improving access. And um, well, I think everybody on this call has said, it is, are you going to go to your friends and family first, or are you going to go to the U.S. government that's going to potentially take nine to 12 months? So um, Riverside is a pretty big firm with a lot of um, institutional quality uh, players in our back office, and so we're able to do something like this. It's much harder, I think, if you're a first-time fund, if you're an entrepreneur, but I, I do think that buyouts are a way of really encouraging people to uh, grow a small company. And so if we could figure out the right way to improve the access also at the same time, then I think it would be really a great program, personally. Pam, do these- that Chris is gonna tell me what all the rules are that I should watch out for. Right. That's how he earns his keep. Right. Um, and, and by the way, just as a quick aside, Bailey, when you asked whether you'd go to friends and family or the U.S. government for nine to 18 months, I was, is that a trick question? I, and I wasn't sure about that. But what, what are some of your reactions to what you're hearing from our colleagues, Pam and Chris, today? Yeah, I think they've, they've had excellent points. I just, honestly, I'm just grateful. I, I mean, that when I say, uh, you know, we, we need the feedback, right? Um, I think that's an elegant part of this whole process is that we have an opportunity to go out with a, a proposed rule. And I, I, have, I have a great boss and Administrator Guzman who, and I, I love this. She just, um, she's so encouraging and supportive. And she's remember, it's a draft. It's your proposal, right? And how do you make drafts better? get a lot of really smart brains on those drafts and they don't all need to be inside the agency. And if we truly are making it great, we are getting perspectives from, you know, different uh, sides of the political aisle, from uh, different seats at the table, from LPs, from GPs, from entrepreneurs, from service providers, from attorneys. So that way we can be thoughtful about the unintended consequences of uh, different things that we're looking at. And, and that's what is going to make it work um, that's how we ensure that we have that flexibility so we can diversify the program so we can expand it and grow it. But we can do it in what I'll call a risk aware way. And, and that's also uh, on the risk side, you know, a mind shift that um, you know, we're tackling culturally uh, within the organization. And, you know, we need to really embrace um, as we do seek to make these reforms and changes of moving to having the governance structures and processes in place to manage risk rather than avoid risk. So I'll I'll go for a uh, cheerleading lightning round for all three of you in just a minute, but I'll start. Um, when I took the job and arrived, they gave me a bust of President Dwight Eisenhower, which apparently they gave, maybe they still do, Bailey, they would give That's for all the good. political, <laughs> yeah, all the political appointees got one. And, and I, at the time, I met President Dwight Eisenhower as a very small boy after he left the presidency. I was a very small boy, although I have gray hair. Um, and I think at the time I was the only person in the building that had actually met the president that started the program back in 1958. But I, but I certainly cherish that that bust. But I'll I'll start the cheerleading with this. Um, all of us, those who live in D.C. or those who are American citizens, interact with the federal government in a wide variety of ways, sometimes uh, in, in distressing ways. And what I would tell, what I told folks after I I, I left the job, I said I, I I can't think of a better way 
that the government and your tax dollars are implemented than the programs at the SBA writ large, but specifically, biased as I was, the Office of Investment and Innovation, both the SBIC program we focused on today, but the SBIR program, STTR program, and incubators and accelerators were absolutely revelatory for me uh, as a private sector person, seeing seeing ways that tax dollars could uh, could 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 form vitality and velocity and, and and impact in ways that affected a whole bunch of Americans very very positively. So I got on the cheerleading squad early, but uh, not to put any of you on the spot as cheerleaders. But I'd like a lightning round, and I'll start with Pam and then Chris and then Bailey. You get the last word to talk about the program and sort of overall your thoughts and, and enthusiasm for it, Pam. Well, when we went to do our first SBIC fund in 2010, everybody said, you're an idiot. Why in the world would you do something in partnership with the government? You are just dumb. And actually, it turned out to be really one of the best things we had ever done because it was, I mean, what a great partner. What a great LP. And um, sorry, limited partner. What a great investor. Um, so, so, you know, we have, uh, we did one in 2010, we did one in 2014, then our control strategy sort of outgrew the program and wanted to do slightly bigger deals. But when we went back to the startup land with our credit fund, you know, they were a great partner once again. So I, I am a huge cheerleader. I think everything has um, is working so much better today than it, you know, was historically, not, not when you were there, Mark, but you thank know, you so a much period when things were not so good. And um, so, you know, I, I think uh, access and um, staffing are still issues and they always, and they will be for a long time. And I know you're well aware of that. So, Chris lightning round to you, little cheerleading before we wrap up. Uh, clearly, the program has come a long way um, since the mid 2000s um, when it was kind of out of low. I've got you know, somewhere in here, I have this hearing transcript from the House of Representatives when everyone was all upset about the participating securities program. I think we need to try to find a way to go back to, as Bailey said, the statutory patient long term capital. Can't be too long, though, because you know, we do have to get paid back. Um, and investors need to realize exits, and that's why I think buyouts are are an important part of the ecosystem of investing, because they're not all going to go public. Most of them won't go public, um, and it provides a way for these companies to stay within control and not be bought necessarily by a huge strategic purchaser, although that's not so bad on it. Again, the markets will dictate that, but I think we should try to find some sort of an equity program. Um, the, the licensing criteria is very rigorous. The underwriting standards are high. Um, you know, smart people at SBA. We just, I, you know, I think just, you know, there was a cultural comment about risk aversion, right? And a different mindset. But people are, they behave in accordance with incentives. We don't want to have the go-go days of the late 90s again. Frankly, this might be a good time to try a program, right? We're not running hot like we were in 2021 um, and in other areas where there are people talking about perhaps we've had an investment bubble might not be the right word, but some enthusiasm. Um, I think that this is a good time to be raising money. Uh, there's a lot of people talking about, you know, likely tough times coming ahead for a whole host of reasons. And uh, I think this would be a great time to get some equity funds done but in a way that makes sense for the program that doesn't otherwise damage what we already have. Because as you can tell from what Pam said, what we have is pretty good. So with uh, about a minute or so left, Bailey, you have the final word. Uh, you took the job over a year ago. I assume your enthusiasm, if nothing, is, is probably accelerated since you've learned so much. So tell us your thoughts on your job and what you see in the future. Well, I wake up excited every single day. I had an itch to serve. Uh, that uh, it, you know, came a while ago and uh, you know the timing worked out with just a confluence of events and never in my wildest dreams could I have imagined that I'd be having a, an opportunity to serve and get back to an industry that I care so deeply about. Um, you know, I'd leave us in the comments of, you know, we need to walk and chew gum, right? Um, the country needs us to right now. Uh, 
we, we need to get money into uh, those capital intensive technologies. We need to get it into uh, businesses to support the industrial transformation, the energy transformation, these things that cost a lot of money up front that, you know, servicing the debt on it is, is not going to work in the places where the private markets alone are not incentivized to go. And we're so fortunate in that Congress many, many years ago set us up so that way we actually can make these investments at the fund level very attractive through the use of our authorities. And SBICs are for profit. These are return seeking investments, right? These are not grants. This is about alignment of the investors in the funds, the investors in the company and the federal government. I couldn't think of a better way for us to come together and make sure that we're supporting the domestic needs that we have right now to reinvest in the country. And so we have to do this. And the more pipes that we have out there to get the money out to more funds, to get reach out to more small businesses and to be flexible about what type of capital and to meet those businesses where we are, where they are, the better, right? We, we have to do this right now, but it's going to take all of us together. And it's going to take the LPs, the GPs, the attorneys, the industry associations. Um, and we have amazing partners. And I'm excited to go on this journey with everyone together. A compelling clarion call from the head of the Office of Investment and Innovation at the Small Business Administration, Bailey. Uh, and to Pam and Chris, thank all three of you for another exciting and informative session brought to you by the Bipartisan Policy Center. I'm Mark Walsh, BPC board member. Thanks, all, thanks to all of you for attending today. And again, thank you to our panel. I hope you have a wonderful rest of the day.